Hello! Welcome to the Introduction to Proofs video for Equivalence Relations. My name is Professor Michael Polyuk. The learning objective for this video is, by the end of this video, you should be able to check if a given relation is transitive, symmetric, or reflexive. Our motivation for looking at equivalence relations is that often things are equal in some ways, but different in others. And sometimes you care about certain things being equal, but you don't care about certain other things being unequal. Equivalence relations capture this idea. So that's a little bit abstract. Let's look at a concrete example. The numbers two halves and three thirds are different representations, right? One has only twos in it, one has only threes in it, but they are equivalent amounts. So for example, if you're baking two one half scoops is the same as three one-third scoops. Now, of course, these are using different scoops, so they're, they're different in some ways, but for the purposes of baking, they're the same. Really, that's wh why we're interested in equivalence relations. Often in math, we're just concerned with being uh, equivalent in some ways, even if in other ways they're different. We have three main definitions today. And they're all about relations. So a relation R on a set X is reflexive if for all X, XX is in R. In other words, every element is related to itself. A relation is symmetric if for all XY, whenever XY is related, then YX is related. So the symmetry here is in terms of XY versus YX. Finally, we have transitive. A relation is transitive if for all points x, y, z in x, whenever x, y is related and y, z is related, then x, z is related. This should maybe remind you of the triangle inequality in some way. We're going to see a bunch of examples of this. Now, if a relation has all three of these properties, it's called an equivalence relation. An equivalence relation is one that is symmetric, reflexive, and transitive. It turns out that equivalence relations exactly capture the notion of sameness, where what sameness means depends on your context. But these three properties give us all of the core ideas of being the same uh, that we're used to. One important note, all of these three properties are universal properties for all x, for all xy, for all xz. Uh, all x, y, z. Now, if you're trying to show that a relation fails, so if you're trying to show that a relation is not symmetric, then you only need to come up with one counterexample, right? The negation of a for all statement is a there exists statement. All right, all of this is very abstract. Let's look at a bunch of non-examples and examples. It turns out that looking at non-examples first is more helpful. It helps us to see when things are things don't have these properties. The first non-example is x is the reals, and the relation is x less than y. This is not reflexive because 1, 1 is not an element of R1. 1 is not less than 1. Is it symmetric? Well, it's also not symmetric. To, to see that it's not symmetric, we produce a counterexample. 1, 2 is related because one is less than two. But if you reverse the order, two, one is not in the relation because two is not less than one. Finally, what about transitive? Yes, this is transitive. Let's see a proof. If x, y is in R1 and y, z is in R1, our goal is to show that x, z is in R1. This is a very short definition unwinding proof. x, y in R1 means that x is less than y. y, z in R1 means that y is less than z. So we have x less than y and y less than z. So we must have that x is less than z. This is a property of less than. Since x is less than z, we get what we want. A lot of the time today, our proofs will be definition unwinding. Now let's look at a related example. It's the same relation, except this time we take x less than or equal to y. How do things change? 
Which of the three properties do you think are going to change? It turns out that this one is reflexive, because if you take any real number, x will be less than or equal to x. And it's not symmetric and not transitive for the basically the exact same reasons. Let's look at our final non-example. This time, let x be the rationals, and the relation will be all pairs such that the absolute value of x minus y is less than 3. One useful thing to think about is, uh, well, we're going to go through this, this proof sort of purely algebraically, but it's helpful to remember that the absolute value of x minus y can be thought of as the distance between x and y. And when you think of it in terms of distance, it's helpful to come, it makes it easier to come up with counterexamples and examples of things. Is it reflexive? Yes. It's reflexive because the absolute value of x minus x is always 0, which is definitely less than 3. Is it symmetric? Yes. If you start by assuming that xy is in the relation, that means that absolute value of x minus y is less than 3. Now what does this tell you about the absolute value of y minus x? You can factor out a minus 1, and then the absolute value of minus 1 doesn't change anything. So then we have the absolute value of y minus x is less than 3 because it's the same, because we knew that the absolute value of x minus y was less than 3. So here we use a couple of properties of absolute value. Finally, I want you to come up with a counterexample to transitive. Think about distance. Here's the counterexample that I came up with. One is related to three because the absolute value of 1 minus 3 is 2. 3 is related to 5, because the absolute value of 3 minus 5 is 2. But the absolute value of 1 minus 5 is 4, so that's too big. The idea here is that this relation is saying is close, saying that x and y are close, where close means the distance is less than 3. Now you can have two things that are close, their distance is less than 3. Two other things that are close, their distance is less than 3. But when you go from the first to the last, the distance is large. So that's the intuition for how I came up with this counterexample. Note that the intuition isn't contained in the proof, and the proof is purely algebra. Now let's look at some examples. Let's start with x being the integers. And the relation is all x, y, such that the absolute value of x is equal to the absolute value of y. This is reflexive, because the absolute value of anything is equal to the absolute value of itself. This is symmetric, because if the absolute value of x is equal to the absolute value of y, then of course the absolute value of y is equal to the absolute value of x. And it's transitive for basically the same reason. This proof isn't particularly interesting. There's no deep idea going on. Everything sort of just works. And when something like that happens, it should make us a little bit skeptical. Did we do something wrong? Also, it should get us thinking about, um, is there a more general thing that's true? So in this case, we ask ourselves, did we use any special properties of the absolute value? Did we use, for example, the triangle inequality, or did we use the fact that the absolute value of minus 1 is equal to 1? Did we do that anywhere? It turns out that we didn't, and this isn't really an example related to the absolute value. This is an example about functions. So let's extract this as a lemma. If f is a function from x to y, then r, which is the collection of all x1, x2, such that f of x1 is equal to f of f x2, then this is a relation, and it's an equivalence relation on what? So is this an equivalence relation on x or y? Well, remember that it's a collection of pairs uh, of x, so that means it's a relation on x. We're relating two things in x based on their outputs, but we're still relating two things in x. 
Okay, in the next video, we'll go over some more detailed examples, some more uh, sophisticated examples.